In the last part of this module, we looked at <coughs> the general analysis of the circulation of capital. Using the circuit of capital, we understood various stages of the circuit, we understood various phases of the circuit, the stocks and flows that lie hidden in the circuit. Now, we would like to go back to investigating some of the issues related to the question of realization of surplus value. We are going to divide this discussion about the realization of surplus value into two parts. The realization of surplus value will involve <coughs> two types of questions. One question will relate to the question of aggregate demand. So, we will try to understand the, the issues related to the generation of aggregate demand. The other question or other sets of questions would relate to <clears throat> what we can call the use value basis of production. What the use value basis of production refers to is what we today call the product mix of output, meaning how much consumption goods are produced and how much machinery is produced. We will see that both these issues are important to understand the question of realization of surplus value. So let's start with the question of aggregate demand. What the question of aggregate demand really boils down to can be understood again using the circuit of capital. So let's, let's write the circuit of capital. So the capitalist starts with the sum of money, goes to the market, purchases two types of commodities, means of production, labor power, brings them together in the production process. The finished commodity comes out and then it is sold for a sum of money. Now the question of aggregate demand really boils down to two types of issues. One is the issue of finance and the other is the issue of spending. So let's first look at the issue of finance. Now the issue of finance can be really understood quite easily by considering the two ends of the circuit. Now we know in the process of production value has been created, not only value but surplus value. So therefore, the value of C prime, which is the finished commodities, is bigger than the value of C, which is the bundle of commodities that was purchased by the capitalist to start out the production process. The value of C is represented by the sum of money M. Therefore, the system, if it started out with a sum of money, will need some extra sum of money at this point to realize the value contained in C prime because of the simple fact that the value of C prime is bigger than the value of C, which was purchased with the sum of money M. So value of C prime will need to be met or will need to be realized in a quantity of money M prime. And we know M prime is bigger than M. And therefore, the difference between the two, which is the representation in monetary form of the surplus value, there will need to be generation of some source of finance to purchase this additional value, which has been created the surplus value. So the question is, how does the capitalist system provide this finance this addition, additional finance to realize the extra value that has been created and embedded in the commodity bundle, the finished commodities. And there are two ways in which the system can provide this extra source of extra finance to realize this surplus value. The first is the setting that Marx talked about, which was the commodity money system. So when Marx was discussing the structure of capitalism, what we had was a commodity money system. So gold or silver was used as a commodity. 
when we are in the context of a commodity money system, this extra source of finance can be found if the production of gold is kept pace with the rest of the economy. So that period after period, extra gold of the amount of delta M is produced, which will then be useful to realize this extra surplus value. Now gold being a commodity will be produced, but gold has the important feature that in a commodity money system, it, it, it is the money commodity. Therefore, it does not need to be sold to realize its value. When it is created, it already has its value. So therefore, if the system is able to produce gold in a commodity money system at the rate that is necessary to realize this extra value, then the capitalist system will be able to generate the extra finance to continuously keep realizing the value and surplus value produced. And this discussion is present in, in towards the end of volume two. But you might say that we no longer live in a commodity money system, and that's true. From the <clears throat> early 20th century onwards, especially from mid 20th century onwards, we don't have a commodity money system. So when we don't have a commodity money system, what is the mechanism available to a capitalist system to make sure that the means of realizing this surplus value is available. What the capitalist system does when we are in a non-commodity money system, so we are now in a non-commodity money system, and here the role of the central bank becomes important. In a non-commodity money system, the money commodity is replaced by the provision of credit. And the provision of credit in a mature capitalist economy is ultimately controlled by the central bank of the economy. The central bank makes available what economists call high-powered money. Through the commercial banking system, the high-powered money provides the amount of credit that is necessary to the, to the whole capitalist system, both to support its production and consumption needs. So when we are in a non-commodity money system, what becomes important is the provision of high-powered money by the central bank. Once the central bank is able to provide the adequate amounts of high-powered money, the system generates the amount of credit that is necessary to realize the, commodity, the extra surplus value that has been created. So therefore, either in a commodity money system or in a non-commodity money system, the capitalist system does have mechanism to make available adequate amounts of finance that is necessary to purchase the commodities that have been produced and therefore to realize the value and surplus value that has been generated. Now, even if adequate finance is available, there is still an additional issue of spending. So even if the banking system is able to provide credit, it might still be the case that key economic actors are not willing to take up that credit and make spending. So therefore, the second issue is about spending. There can be cases where the capitalist system has a lot of credit available, but it is not used to finance actual expenditures. And we know that we have lived through a financial crisis where this has become very important. So there are tons of cash which are lying idle with firms but those are not being used to make investment. So even if finance is available, it is possible for capitalist economic actors, important economic actors in capitalism, not to convert that finance into spending. So the additional issue of spending becomes important. When there is adequate spending in the system, 
the system does well, realizes all the surplus value that is reinvested and the circuit of capital goes on and on, the flow of value increases. But for example, there might be a case when capitalists do not invest. When capitalists do not invest, even if finance is easily available, what does that, what does that imply? Well, what that implies is that some of the surplus value that has been produced will not be realized. In other words, the turnover time of capital will go down. Sorry, the turnover time will go up, meaning capital, each atom of value will require a longer amount of time to traverse the circuit, meaning the turnover time goes up. That means what happens? There is a slowdown. So the speed with which capital traverses the circuit from here to here goes down. And therefore, there is a slowdown of the flow of value. What does that mean? It means there is a slowdown of the economy. So economic, economic growth falls. When economic growth falls, some sector of the economy has to step in and increase spending so as to revive growth. In capitalist economies, there is the state. With fiscal policy, the state often steps in when capitalist investment has fallen and that is what revives the amount of spending back again, the turnover time falls and the growth process kicks, goes up. So this is the, the fluctuation of the economy that we today know as the business cycles. So the fluctuations of business cycles are created by the spending decisions which lead to fluctuations in demand. And we can use the circuit of capital to understand how the fluctuations of demand lead to fluctuations of growth through an increase or decrease in the turnover time, which is merely a reflection of the increase or decrease of the spending of key actors in the capitalist economy. Now one thing that I would like to emphasize is that in a capitalist economy, the key economic actor which makes all the spending decisions or which is the source of all spending decision is the capitalist. It is the capitalist who has to use the sum of money to purchase different commodities which is the beginning of all other kinds of spending. Because when the capitalist uses a part of his sum of money to purchase means of production, what that means is that commodities produced by other capitalists have found a market. So then that makes available finance to those capitalists in turn to make additions to their capital stock by investing. The other part of the spending goes towards purchasing labor power. Labor power, when it is sold, converts the commodity that is owned by workers into incomes, that is their wage income. Those wage incomes in turn go towards purchasing consumption goods. So that is another spending. But the important thing to realize is that the source of all spending is the capitalist making the investment. And therefore, when we think about fluctuations of demand in a capitalist economy, our analytical focus should be to try to understand why there is a fluctuation in the spending of capitalists, because that is the main source of all kinds of spending in the economy. And therefore, all kinds of short-run fluctuations that arise because of spending and fluctuations of demand come from fluctuations in the spending decisions of capitalists. So that is the set of issues that we need to understand when we think about the question of aggregate demand. Now let us move on to the second aspect of the realization of surplus value, which is to understand the issues related to 
what I have called the use value basis of production or what modern economists call the product mix of output. So let us see what this entails. As always, we can organize our discussion with reference to the circuit of capital. So to motivate the discussion, let us rewrite the circuit once again. So the capitalist goes to the market to buy two types of commodities which are then brought to the production process. Finished commodities arise and then they are sold. Now what we want to concentrate on now is to think about the first stage of the circuit. What the capitalist is doing is purchasing two different types of commodities. Part of the money is used to purchase means of production and part of the money is used to purchase labor power. Labor power in turn needs to purchase consumption goods. So therefore, the investment decision of the capitalist relies on the availability of the correct proportion of means of production, let us call them machines and consumption goods, let us call them food, because food will be needed by the workers whom the capitalist hires. And the capitalist will need to buy the machines and the raw materials for the production process. So therefore, there has to be some way in which the capitalist system produces the right mix of consumption goods and production goods because without the right mix, when the capitalist comes to the market with the sum of money, if there is an excess or a shortage of either of these, the process of production of capital will halt and there will be problems. So the use value basis of production or the right product mix of output relates to the question of how the capitalist system is able to generate the right amount of production goods and consumption goods. So this is the question that had been discussed by lots of economists before Marx. Some progress had been made by a group of economists, French economists known as the physiocrats. Marx borrowed some key insights from physiocrats but then reworked it to answer this question for a capitalist economy. What he did was to bring about a conceptual innovation by thinking of the economy as being divided into different departments. We will now follow his analysis which is also known as the analysis of the reproduction schemes to answer this question of how the capitalist system is able to produce the right mix of production and consumption goods that is necessary for the smooth functioning of the system. To do so, we will follow Marx and divide the total economy into two parts. So the total economy is composed of two departments. Let us call that department 1 and department 2. What is the difference? Department 1 produces means of production and department 2 produces means of consumption. So the question of how the economy generates the correct amount of means of production and means of consumption really boils down to the question of the correct size, the correct relative size of these two departments. One department which produces the means of consumption, another which produces the means of production. Now to answer this or to address this question about the correct proportions, let us think of the total amount of value created in department 1. 
So the total amount of value created in department 1, let's call that W1. That is the sum of the constant capital used up in production of department 1, variable capital used in the production of department 1, and the surplus value generated in the production of department 1. So W1 refers to the total value created in department 1. That in turn is composed of C1, which is the total constant capital used, V1, the total variable capital used, and S1, which is the surplus value used. In a similar way, the total value created in department 2, let's call that W2, that is composed of C2, which is the constant capital used in department 2, V2, which is the variable capital used in department 2, and S2, which is the surplus value generated in department 2. Now, <clears throat> let us think a little bit about these components C1, V1, and S1, and similarly C2, V2, and S2. C1 and C2, what do they represent? Well, they represent the constant capital used up in the production in department 1 and department 2. Therefore, C1 and C2 will need to be replaced because that is the means of production used up. So therefore, C1 and C2 also represent the demand for new means of production. So they are the demand for means of production. What about V1 and V2? V1 and V2 represent variable capitals in the two department, meaning they are the wage which has been used to purchase labor power. Now the wage is the income of the worker. What will they do with it? They will use it to purchase consumption goods. Therefore, V1 and V2 represent the demand for consumption goods. The third component is S1 and S2, and that is more complicated, but also more interesting. What is S1 and S2? S1 and S2 represent surplus value generated in the two departments. Now the surplus value, as we have seen in the circuit of capital, can be used in two different ways. Part of it is used for consumption. So it gives rise to a demand for consumption goods. But part of it can be reinvested in the production process, which generates, which is used to hire more workers and buy more machines. So therefore, it can demand, it can generate the demand for means of production also. So S1 and S2 can represent the demand for both means of production and means of consumption. So let me move S1 and S2 here because this is probably not visible. S1 and S2 represent the surplus values generated in the two departments. Now we know that surplus value can be used to support the consumption of the capitalists in which case it leads to a in demand for consumption goods but part of the surplus value can also be used to reinvest in the production process, in which case part of it will be used to purchase means of production. So S1 and S2 leads to the demand for or can lead to the demand for means of production and means of consumption. Now in our analysis, to understand the basic issues involved, we will look at a simple case. The simple case will be where all the surplus value is used for consumption. That simple case is known by Marx, is called by Marx as simple reproduction. What does that mean? Simple reproduction means that all the surplus value is used for consumption. If all the surplus value is used for consumption, then none of it is used for reinvestment. 
What does that mean? It means that the revenue that is generated by selling the commodities, one part of it goes towards recouping the cost. The other part is surplus value. If all of the surplus value is used for consumption, that means the scale of production remains constant over time because there is no reinvestment, there is no growth of the means of production, therefore the scale of production remains fixed. That is what Marx means by simple reproduction. But even in the case of simple reproduction, which is unrealistic, it is useful to study simple reproduction because it allows us to understand the structure of relations that must prevail between the two departments to ensure that there is smooth reproduction over time. After having understood the simple case of simple reproduction, we can then study the case of expanded reproduction where some of the surplus value is plowed back into the production process which leads to an increase in the scale of production and growth of the capital stock. But the essential ideas remain the same and therefore we can abstract from, ignore this other complication which arises because of growth to understand the basic logic by just studying the case of simple reproduction. So that's what we will do in this class. When you study the notes, you can look at the appendix. There is a detailed discussion of expanded reproduction. But the essential ideas can be understood even by just looking at simple reproduction. So let's look at simple reproduction. So we want to understand the structure of relationship thus that must prevail between the two departments to ensure smooth reproduction over time. So to do that, let us look at both the supply and the demand sides of the market for the output of the two departments. Let's start out by looking at department one. In value terms, what is the total supply of output produced by department 1? Well, the total value of output produced by department 1 is W1, which in turn is the sum of C1 plus V1 plus S1 that we have already seen, that W1 is C1 plus V1 plus S1. So in value terms, this sum C1 plus V1 plus S1 represents the total output, the total supply of commodities produced by department 1. Now let's look at the demand side. Where does the demand for the output of department 1 come from? Well, department 1 produces means of production. Means of production will be de demanded by the two departments because a part of the means of production that has been used in the production process gets used up and will need to be replaced. If we look at department 1, C1 represents the part of constant capital that is used up in the production process. Therefore, for the production process to keep going, that will need to be replaced. And that is why C1 represents the demand for means of production that arises from department 1. Similarly, C2 represents the demand for means of production that arise from department 2 because department 2 produces W2 which itself is the sum of C2 plus V2 plus S2. C2 represents the value of constant capital used up in the production of means of consumption. So the amount of machinery used up in producing food well, those machineries will need to be replaced if the production of food has to go on in the next period. Therefore, C2 becomes the second source of demand for the means of production which is produced by department 1. Now, let's look at department 2. The total supply, that is the total value of output produced by department 2 is C2 plus V2 plus S2. 
what is the demand well demand for means of consumption comes from two sources all the workers involved in production in department 1 will earn the wage income v1 all of the wage income will be used for making consumption purchasing consumption goods so v1 is one source of demand v2 is the wage income of workers in the second industry the second department that will also be used to purchase consumption goods so part of the demand for consumption goods comes from the wage income of the workers involved in the two departments the second source of demand for consumption goods comes from capitalism capitalists also need to eat and since we are studying simple reproduction this is the case where all of the surplus value is used for consumption and therefore s1 is also the source of demand for consumption goods and so also is s2 so the total um, demand for the output of department 1 comes from the consumption needs of workers and the consumption needs of capitalists now let's take up any of these two equations to find the condition for equilibrium condition for equilibrium is when supply is equal to demand so when i say that the system needs to smoothly reproduce over time it means that there is neither excess supply nor excess demand nor is too much output produced nor is too little that can happen only when the total supply and total demand are equal now let's take this equation both sides of this equation have this term c1 which we can cancel out so what remains of this equation is that v1 plus s1 is equal to c2 or what we are saying is c2 divided by v1 plus s1 is equal to 1 now this is precisely the condition which defines the relative size of the two departments that is necessary to ensure smooth reproduction over time let's understand what this is saying this is saying that the total amount of capital constant capital used in department 2 that is in the department that produces means of consumption must be exactly equal to the sum of variable capital and surplus value produced in the other department so therefore this condition gives us a way to find the relative size of the two departments which is necessary to ensure that there is smooth reproduction what will happen if this reproduction condition holds if this reproduction condition holds then there will be neither too much output produced nor too little output produced and by output we don't only mean the total amount of output but also the right composition neither will too much machines be produced neither will too much food be produced neither will too little machines be produced neither will too little food be produced just the right amount of food and machines will be produced which will be what the system needs to make sure that the process of production continues smoothly over time so with this analysis marx clarified that what is essential to ensure that smooth reproduction takes place over time in a capitalist system is a key idea about proportionality even in this simple framework we are able to see that the system will be able to produce and reproduce itself over time smoothly without getting into problems of shortage of commodities or glut of commodities is only if the two departments are related to each other in a specific way now these could be specific numbers say this could be 100 this could be 50 this could be 25 and then plugging those numbers we will get a specific ratio that must be maintained between these two departments to ensure that the system reproduces itself over time smoothly 
if the system is able to generate this ratio, this relative size of the two departments, then it will be able to smoothly reproduce itself over time. What if it does not? What if there is a shock to the system because of which the size of department 1 becomes too large compared to the size of department 2? And by too large, I mean too large with reference to this condition. If that happens, then the system will get into what Marx calls crisis of disproportionality. Because in that case, too much means of production will be produced than will be necessary to for the demand of the system. And therefore, that, will, that can very well be the beginning of a crisis. Now, since the capitalist system is a crisis-prone system, every 30, 40 years it gets into deep crises. The analysis of crisis is a very important topic of, of Marxist political economy. Marx never got the chance to write out a systematic account of capitalist crisis. But we do find scattered notes and scattered comments on crisis in various parts of his texts. And it is possible to reconstruct a comprehensive theory of crisis on the basis of those notes. But in this course, we will not have time or occasion to get into that. But nonetheless, I would like to flag this issue that a crisis of disproportionality is very much one of the important ways in which a system can get into a crisis. There are other ways in which the system can get into a crisis, but that is something that we are not going to be discussing in great detail. With that, we come to the end of this module. In this module, we have uh, looked at the main argument laid out by Marx in volume two of Capital, which relates to the question of realization of surplus value. Since surplus value is realized through the sale of commodities, what is important is the sphere of circulation. That is why in the first part of this module, we began with a general analysis of the circulation of capital. We looked at the circuit of capital at its various aspects and understood very important concepts. With that, then we understood and returned to the question of, about the realization of surplus value we looked at the issue of aggregate demand, and we also looked at the issue of the correct product mix or the use value basis of production. With that, we come to an end of the analysis that Marx laid out in volumes one and two. The next module will take us into volume three. And let me briefly say how it will be related to what we have so far studied. In volume one, we studied the process of generation of surplus value and also its accumulation. In volume two, we understood how the surplus value that has been generated can be realized through sale. In volume three, we will then analyze how this surplus value that has been generated gets redistributed throughout societies and emerges as the income of different fractions of the ruling class. The capitalists who are involved in production, the merchants, the money capitalists, and the resource owners. That is the main argument we will see in the next module.